festival of the Reformation, a festival of the church, a festival that recalls the recovery of the gospel through the work of Martin Luther and other reformers. Um, I believe all of our hymns are printed in the worship booklet, the yellow worship booklet, so you will uh, not need the hymnal unless you want to refer to the tunes. This is based on Luther's Deutsche Messe, his vernacular mass or divine service. Uh, and most of the hymns are written by Luther and have that uh, late medieval feel, which uh, some of us enjoy and some of us bear with. Um, the, uh, I think that's all I have to say. There is no outline of today's message, so we'll have to listen carefully. <laughs> And uh, are there announcements that need to be made before we proceed? Walt? Yes. LX will be one week from tomorrow. We're not going to do it on Halloween. I think yeah. that's there probably wise. <laughs> there will be choir rehearsal right after the service, but there will not be any choir rehearsal this Wednesday because the bell choir is not going to be here. Very okay. good. That's it. And this Wednesday, our circuit is having a Reformation celebration, a Vespers, that is to say, non communion service, and our bell choir will be featured. Uh, and uh, hope that you will be able to come to that service at 6 p.m. at uh, Calvary Lincoln Park on Electric Avenue. There. Any other announcements that we need to make? None. Uh, we will mark this festival service with a procession. Uh, we may stand for the opening hymn uh, following the ringing of the bells. May the Lord bless our worship today.
Christ in Christ, you know that our Lord Jesus Christ, out of unspeakable love, instituted at the last this his supper as a memorial and proclamation of his death suffered for our sins. This commemoration requires a firm faith to make the heart and conscience of everyone who wants to use and partake of this supper sure and certain that Christ has suffered death for all his sins. But whoever doubts and does not in some manner feel such faith should know that the supper is of no avail to him but rather be to his hurt and he should stay away from it and since we cannot see such faith and it is known only to God we leave it to the conscience of him who comes and mid profiteering unchastity and the like and are not minded to renounce them shall here with be barred and be warned faithfully not to come lest they incur judgment and damnation for their own souls as on himself. 1 Corinthians 11, 29. If, however, someone has fallen because of weakness and proves by his acts that he earnestly desires to better himself, this grace and communion of the body and blood of Christ shall not be nigh to him. In this fashion, each must judge himself and look out for himself. For God is not mocked, Galatians 6, 7, nor will he give that which is holy unto the dogs or cast the pearls before swine. We stand for the intro which is sung responsibly at the asterisk. I will speak of your testimonies before kings, O Lord.
be with you. And also with you. Let us pray. Almighty and gracious Lord, pour out your Holy Spirit on your faithful people. Keep us steadfast in your grace and truth. Protect and deliver us in times of temptation. Defend us against all enemies. And grant to your church your saving peace. Through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Amen. Of those who has 
who has faith in Jesus. Then what becomes of our boasting? It is excluded. But what kind of law? By a law of works? No, but by the law of faith. For we hold that one is justified apart. <clears throat> we hold that one is justified by faith apart from works of the law. This is the word of our Lord. Thanks, Thanks be to God. God. Jesus 
for all who believe. For there is no distinction, for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God, and are justified by His grace as a gift, the redemption that is in Christ Jesus. This is our text. We may sit. <coughs> When I was young, I was told by my parents, don't accept gifts from strangers. As a child, I did not understand this. I got most things for free and didn't much care where they came from. Then, in school, they read us the story of the Trojan horse. That horse that the Trojans accepted, it contained enemy soldiers. So you don't accept, you beware of Greeks bearing gifts, it was the saying there. And I remembered my parents' exhortation. And then another day at school, a bigger kid gave me some of his candy and acted as if that entitled him to boss me around the rest of the day. I suddenly realized that, that gifts create relationship and obligation, and I did not want a relationship with this kid. I later observed how some kids would act like your friend and give you some powder or pills or a, a shot glass of liquid, which would, they would then sell you on an ongoing basis. And recently I received offers on the internet to get a prize or an inheritance or even a high paying job. If only I share a few personal details like my bank account number so they can send me the money. Few pieces of advice have proven more useful over my life than that of don't accept gifts from strangers. So why do so many who identify as Christians find it hard to accept the grace of God and insist that eternal life must be earned I knew a man who had fallen behind in his house payments and ran into some debt. His father would have helped him financially, but the younger man felt he could not bear to lose face in that way. He went to a stranger instead who turned out to be a loan shark. The story did not end well. Why did this man trust a stranger rather than his own father? One word. Pride. Now, like many human qualities, there is a good aspect as well as a negative aspect of pride. To take pride in one's work or in one's appearance is to value these things, and that is commendable. But to value oneself to the point of overlooking the value of others is sinful pride. Pride that deludes and often destroys the prideful. In the case of the man who thought he would lose face before his father, his pride led him to trust the wrong people. And this because he would not admit his need, nor allow his dependence on his father. It is this fear of losing face before God and others that keeps many away from church as the house of God. It keeps many from seeking God's presence in His church. Oh, people will come to your church rummage sale. They will attend a dinner, a social. They'll even give money to those who beg. But visiting a church and worship makes many people feel guilty and uncomfortable. Many people approach church the same way they approach the dental office or the medical clinic with fear and apprehension as to what will be discovered about them. With all this mistrust, is it a wonder that many people regard God the same way I regard those internet offers of free stuff with distrust, disbelief, and even disgust? We have trouble accepting grace, the forgiveness of God, because we are estranged from Him. For who accepts gifts from strangers? 
Another reason we are prone to earn our way to heaven is because of our flesh. We all know on some level that we will die and that guilt gets punished. But we suppress that knowledge like the main characters of Edgar Allan Poe's The Telltale Heart or of Dostoevsky's Crime and Punishment. Many of us realize on some level that if people treated us like we treat them, we would be in big trouble. So we battle the world so we can stay on top And when the law of God is preached, we feel it. We respond. Hellfire and damnation preaching is gripping, relatable, because it stirs our emotions. We believe it when we are told that we are sinful. We resonate with the predictions of woe. Ever notice Jesus' message was don't worry, and yet Christians are often filled with worry. It's the trust, the lack of trust, we see and experience. Oh, we may insist we are better than others and hope that God grades on the curve, but the message of the law hits most of us in our insecurities. In fact, the most scoffing, the most adamant unbelievers among us are militant atheists because their hearts feel accused and their emotions of hate and detestation of someone they claim does not exist show that they protest too much. Now, since our flesh responds to God's message of law, we feel the need to justify ourselves to prove ourselves, if not to God, then we, that we are good. So charity balls and benefit concerts, patronizing social service organizations and other good causes, all this is very popular among those noted for their questionable morals. Whether billionaire tycoons who bribe, cheat, and steal on the right or celebrities whose personal freedom is expressed in debauchery, conspicuous display, and defiance of conventional norms on the left. We live in an age of virtue signaling where those who cannot trust God look to the world for assurance that they are good. Even the atheist and the worldling, perhaps he most of all, craves for what St. Paul called righteousness or justification. Thus the message of God's law addresses this craving of our flesh and we respond to it. We may not know God, but we know our sin. And since God is a stranger to us, the good news or gospel of forgiveness is like the offer of a free gift from a stranger. We don't trust it. We don't want the relationship it creates. And our pride does not want to admit our need or accept the, the dependency that such a gift implies. Martin Luther experienced this. He took religion very seriously and sought righteousness for himself. At first he hated the term righteousness of God because he thought of God's demand for righteousness, which, if he failed, would condemn him to hell. But in his praying the Psalms, he noticed that the psalmist rejoices in God's righteousness. And Luther wondered why. And then he studied Paul's letter to the Romans, including this passage, which is our text today, and realized that the righteousness of God is that by which he makes and declares us righteousness. It is God's declaration in Christ Jesus that we are made righteous not through the good works or reparations we do, but solely through the forgiveness offered through Christ. As our text Romans 3 declares, 
The righteousness of God through faith in Jesus Christ is for all who believe, justified by His grace as a gift through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus. Luther summarized this gospel teaching in his three solas. The word sola is Latin for alone, that we are saved or received by the righteousness of God, sola gratia, by grace alone, that it is God's gift. <coughs> that we receive it, sola fide, through faith alone, apart from works or feelings. And this is grounded sola scriptura, that is, in scripture alone, unclouded or obscured by church traditions, trends, philosophical considerations, or pious feelings. Do you know God well enough to trust Him and accept His gift of righteousness? You cannot do it on your own. Faith is not a good work that saves. Rather, faith is the gift that God gives so that we might receive His grace. Faith is the receiving hand that accepts God's gifts of forgiveness and righteousness, which create a new relationship with Him. Faith is not, faith is the trust we lack on our own to accept God's gifts. We are saved by this faith alone, and God alone receives the glory. But faith, Luther observes, is never alone. For it is accompanied by other gifts of hope and love, and these together are active in our lives, guiding us to meaningful lives of blessing others. Thus, our hidden righteousness with God by faith is eventually evident to others through our deeds. As we honor God by prayer and worship, and love neighbors through consideration and concern for their needs. But do you know God the right way? Jim and Don were golf buddies who played at least once a month. Jim knew that Don was some kind of physician, but was surprised when his family doctor referred him to Don for thoracic surgery. And Jim didn't want his buddy to cut into him. It wasn't the right relationship. In a similar way, some of us may find that our relationship with God may not be the one of faith and grace as St. Paul presents in our text. Some of us regard God as our buddy, familiar and undemanding. We're not prepared to accept evil from the Lord or commands from our co-pilot. On the other hand, some, like the young Luther, may find their relationship with God dominated by fear and distrust. The right way to know God is the way He reveals Himself in His Word, the Holy Scriptures. Our Bible, as the God of law who demands righteousness which leads to eternal life and as the God of gospel, of good news, who gives righteousness and eternal life through Christ our Lord. You know God as Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, the God who gave you your life, the God who gave His Son to die in your place, the God who sends the Holy Spirit through the Word so that we might believe and receive this righteousness and eternal life this is the God we are called to trust this is the God who enables us to trust him the God who reaches us through his word and message of law and gospel may this God who gave his son that we may be declared righteous give and strengthen that gift of faith to you through today's message. Amen. Amen.
May that peace of God that surpasses understanding keep your hearts and minds through Christ our Lord. Amen. Amen. We may sit for the hymn based on the Nicene Creed. We all believe in one true God. <laughs> Blinded 
and bound in the devil's kingdom to know Jesus Christ, your Son, by faith, that the number of Christians may be increased. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Strengthen us by your Spirit according to your will, both in life and in death, in the midst of both good and evil things, that our wills may be crucified daily and sacrificed to your good and gracious will. Into your merciful hands we commend all who are in need, praying for them at all times, thy will be done. Lord, in your mercy, hear, hear our, our prayer. prayer. Give to us our daily bread. Preserve us from greed and selfish cares, and help us to trust in you to provide for all our needs. Lord, in your mercy, hear, hear our, our prayer. prayer. Forgive us our sins, as we also forgive those who sin against us, so that our hearts may be at peace and may rejoice in a good conscience before you, and that no sin may ever frighten or alarm us. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Lead us not into temptation, O Lord, but help us by your Spirit to subdue our flesh, to turn from the world and its ways, and to overcome the devil with all his wiles. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. And lastly, O Heavenly Father, Deliver us from all evil of both body and soul, now and forever. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. our prayer. We trust, O Lord, in your great mercy to hear and answer us through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Let us pray for these particular requests for Mark uh, Mick, servants who fully recover from COVID. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. prayer. We also pray for, give thanks for hearing our prayers for um, Hannah and Eric Niece upon the birth of Miles Avon Randall Niece, born on October 28th at 9.30 p.m. at 7 pounds, 12 ounces. Lord, in your mercy. Hear our prayer. For our church and its mission in the world, Lord, in your mercy. Hear our prayer. For those suffering in various parts of the world, Ar Armenia, Ukraine, and for my wife uh, and her companions, Mission trip in South Africa, Lord in your mercy. Hear our prayer. For those who serve in our military and other services to protect our country, Lord in your mercy. Hear our prayer. For the many who are in need of healing, for Rosemary Bowie who has had surgery this week, Lord in your mercy. Hear our prayer. And for also all other things whatsoever that are needful. Lord, in your mercy. Hear our prayer. Into your hands, O Lord, we commend all these for whom we pray, trusting in your mercy through your Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. We may sit to receive the offering.
God. It is right to give him thanks and praise. It is truly good right and salutary that we should at all times and all places give thanks to you, O Lord our God, King of all creation. For you have had mercy on us and given your only begotten Son that whoever believes in him should not perish but have eternal life. Grant us your spirit, gracious Father, that we may give heed to the testament of your Son in true faith, and above all, firmly take to heart the words which Christ gives to us, his body and blood, for our forgiveness. By your grace, lead us to remember and give thanks for the boundless love which he manifested to us, when by pouring out his precious blood, he saved us from your righteous wrath and from sin, death, and hell. Grant that we may receive the bread and wine that is his body and blood as a gift, guarantee, and pledge of his salvation. Graciously receive our prayers, deliver and preserve us. To you alone, O Father, be all glory, honor, and worship with the Son and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. In the name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, at his command and with his own words, we receive his testament. Our Lord Jesus Christ, on the night when he was betrayed, took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and gave it to the disciples and said, Eat, eat, this is my body, which is given for you. This do in remembrance of me. In the same way also he took the cup after supper, and when he had given thanks, he gave it to them, saying, Drink of it, all of you. This is my blood of the New Testament, which is shed for you for the forgiveness of sins. This do as often as you drink it in remembrance of me.
body and blood, strengthen and preserve you to life everlasting. Amen.